Lord Jesus, you rule, you reign, you are over all. And you are here with us right now. We pray that as we begin this, this journey of entering into this vision in the book of Revelation, that you will speak to our hearts. You'll open our eyes to see you and our hearts to understand, our minds to comprehend as best we can who you are and what you've done. And then by your power and by your spirit, you would transform our lives to walk in line with your will, your desire, in light of who you are. Meet us in this time, we pray, and teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the, the message that we're beginning today in this series in the book of Revelation, we're calling this series, I Saw Heaven Opened, and today we're talking about a powerful picture, a powerful vision of Jesus. And what's unique about this book of Revelation is that it's a revelation, it's a vision. It actually, John, and this is John who was John the Apostle, his brother John and James, the brothers Peter, James, and John who were close with Jesus. John who walked with Jesus for three years, who watched Jesus die on the cross, saw him in his resurrection glory, saw him ascended to heaven, and now time has gone by. And he's actually on the island of Patmos. There's persecution among the church. Uh, Christians are being uh, martyred for their faith. John, is, as far as we know from history, says he's been physically abused for his faith in Jesus. He's been thrown on this, on this prison island of Patmos. And that, on that island, he has this vision. And man, if you need a vision of Jesus, it's when you're going through hard times. And John was going through a hard time. And this vision was for him that he saw, but it was the vision was, Jesus and the vision says, but tell this, write this down, share it with the churches. The churches then and the church today. And, and so, so John has this incredible vision, and, and it's, it's like this full-blown, he sees glory, he sees, he sees all that happens, he hears it, he smells it. There's a point where there's incense burning, it's like there's smell, there's sight, there's sound. It would be like going to the movies in a movie theater, and it's like the biggest screen you can imagine, and like the seat you're in rumbles and moves, which some of them do these days, which is really kind of crazy. I tried it one time, and it made my eyes jiggle, and I couldn't see the screen, so I felt like I was getting seasick, so I stopped that. But, you know, like a movie. See, and then they had like smell that they pumped into the theater at certain points. And I mean, it'd be like, man, so, so imagine you go and see this incredible movie, and then somebody else says, well, tell me about the movie. And you say, oh, you know, you don't have to see it. I can just tell you with my own words. I'll paint a picture so vivid, it's more vivid than the theater. That's hard to do. It's hard to explain the visuals, the sounds, all that's part of that. Well, here John is, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to, to this vision that he's seen to communicate it to the church then and the church today. It, it would be like going to see the number two selling movie in the history of the world up to this point is Avengers Endgame from the Marvel comics. So Avengers Endgame, right? Imagine going to see that movie and all the battles and all the stuff. And then somebody else says, well, can you just explain it to me just as well as the movie showed it to you? You'd be like... Well, it's hard to explain all the stuff going on. Well, that's kind of like what it was for John. It'd be like if you have a little girl and all of her friends have gone to see one of the top 20 selling movies ever, the movie Frozen. All of her friends have gone to see it and say, oh, honey, you don't have to go see the movie. I'll just tell you about it. She's not going to be happy about that. Some of you have seen Frozen, and if you got a copy of it at home, you've seen it like 40 or 50 or 80 times if you have kids that love that movie. But I thought, you know... The idea of, of how you see a movie, how you hear it, how you experience it, that's the book of Revelation. It's this vision. So I thought I'd give you one more movie that's a little bit more intellectual, a little more highbrow, more of a thinking kind of a movie. Imagine trying to explain this movie to somebody without them actually seeing it. I mean, it'd be hard to capture the brilliance, the insight, the sensitivity. I mean, the poster pretty much gives you the story. Make that go away. Make it go away. There you go. Okay, good. Um, but here John is. And he's had this vision, a vision of Jesus, a vision of heaven, a vision of the end of all things. And he's putting it into words, led by the Holy Spirit for us to understand. Now, I'm going to give you a couple suggestions here. First, I would suggest to you that the book of Revelation is meant to be seen, not so much read. It's meant to be heard, and it's meant to be seen and heard in one sweeping narrative. Imagine going to the movies and saying, well, I'm going to watch the first 10 minutes of the movie, and then next week I'll come back and watch the next 10 more minutes, and I'll, and I'll watch 10 minutes you know, each day or every so often, and then I'll finally get the storyline. Well, sometimes we read Revelation, kind of a chapter, then a chapter, then a chapter, then a chapter. Here's my suggestion to you. In the next nine weeks, as we're walking through this, read the whole book of Revelation a number of times. But do this once. Read the whole book at one time. 
Don't stop reading it until you go from beginning to end. And read it out loud. Read it out loud and and in your mind, picture it. I mean, see the drama unfold. See the picture unfold. See the the creatures and the flying things. And you're going, what? And don't try to figure out what it all means. Just, just, Just see it. Experience it. Imagine being in a movie and every like two minutes somebody says, well, what's that mean? Who's that guy? Some people do that and it's really pleasant. Um, but it's like, it's like, I don't understand. Can you explain that to me? What does that mean? No, you just, you just watch it. So here's my challenge. If you don't like to read, listen to it. You can download free Bible apps that will, that will read the Bible to you. But listen to it all in one sitting or in one walk or in one drive. And if you're in a home with a, as a couple or with a family, read it together, the whole thing. And let the message and the pictures and the vision, the revelation come alive. It will will impact you in a way different than hearing me preach over it week after week after week or or, or reading it bit by bit by bit. And so so as we look at the book of Revelation, I want to give you a little bit of a setting as we get kicking in this off. And I'll come back in the coming weeks and give you a little bit more detail to get the history and the background, what's going on. But, But first of all, the source of this heavenly vision, where is this coming from? So if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Because Revelation tells us where it's coming from. If you have your Bible app or if you have your your iPad or your phone, however you follow on the Bible, open that up. We'll have it on the screens as well. But I want you to listen to Revelation 1, 1 through 3 because it gives sort of the setting. Where's this coming from? So here it is. Revelation 1, 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ. So it's from Jesus and it's of Jesus, right? The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, that's his people, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel, so God sends a heavenly angel, to his servant John, John the Apostle. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he, what's the next word? Saw. It was a vision. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I love this. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. As you read it out loud, there's a blessing in that. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Read this out loud. Listen to it. All in one sweeping narrative. And get the, get the picture, get the storyline, get the glory of God and the, the trembling of the earth and the consummation of all things and, it just, and let it just fill your heart and your mind. And don't break it down every single point. What's that mean? What's that mean? What's that, what's, what's that about? What's going on there? Just, first of all, just see it. See it. Hear the story. Experience it. It will be powerful for you. And then the setting of the vision of Revelation. We need to get kind of a setting of what's going on. So first we need to know John's story a little bit. John has walked with Jesus for three years. He believes in Jesus. Now Christ has ascended. And, And John has been living faithfully for Jesus. He's been following Jesus with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He's been beaten. He's been abused. He's been imprisoned, thrown away on this island. It's a time in the world at this time in the first century where all this is going on, where Christians are feeling persecution, where there's a lot of confusion. They don't know what's coming next. The the political leaders at that that point, the the, the Caesars, uh, there was basically worship of the Caesars. They they were considered gods. And so there was this emperor worship going on. And when you read the book of Revelation, you realize, okay, there's all these people, person after person comes on the throne, and they're God, they're God, but then they die. and And then Jesus sort of shows up in Revelation. It's like, by the way, This is what God looks like. One who reigns and rules forever and ever and ever. But it's a difficult time. And John is in a place that's a hard place physically and it's a hard place emotionally. It's a hard place spiritually. When you're following Jesus and everything seems to go wrong, you know, and and yet he's holding on to Jesus. Here he is on this island, this prison island. And God just says, John, watch this. He unfolds the glory of Jesus and the majesty of God and that the final story of God's victory and glory and heaven. And what a vision. And then Jesus says to John, write down what you've seen and share it with the church. Take what you've seen. Take this picture and share it with the church. And so we have to also understand as we dig into the book of Revelation, the nature of apocalyptic literature it's fun to say, apocalyptic literature. 
Apocalyptic literature is an ancient kind of literature that was around in those days. You see some of it in the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel. There's different books in the Bible that have this apocalyptic literature. Is literature that when you go to it, you know you're going to, like lots of different numbers that mean things and flying creatures and things with eyes and wings and just kind of like, woo, just this really wild stuff. But people in the ancient world understood that kind of literature. It was around in those days. It'd be like if I, if I said, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story here. Once upon a time, once I say that, what do you know? They're, they're fairy tale. There's going to be there's going to be probably a prince or a princess. There's going to be how, if I start with once upon a time, how's it normally going to end? And they all lived happily ever after. I mean, there, there's people. You know that that's a fairy tale. This isn't a fairy tale. This this is apocalyptic. This is this vision, this picture. And we sometimes think, well, we figure out what it means now, but they didn't know it back then. But but I believe that the church in the first century understood the Book of Revelation. They saw the picture, they saw the message, and they let God speak to their hearts. And we need to do the same. We need to open our hearts to, to understand what God is doing and let the power and the beauty and the awe of this come alive. I will let you in on a little secret before we get started in the book of Revelation. Um, we are not going, to, I am not going to try to explain every mysterious image and tell you what it is. I'm not going to get every sign and symbol and say, oh, what this is. Is that I remember, I remember when I was a new Christian, I, there was churches that were saying, oh, oh, you know what? The sign of the beast. It's the birthmark on the forehead of Mikhail Gorbachev. That's, did anybody ever, anybody ever hear that? And, and all through, and then through the years, I've been a Christian now for over 40 years. It's like, oh, no, no, no. It's not. Okay, now, it's, now the mark of the beast is this. It's, there's some people that have theorized recently a new mark of the beast. There's, but here's the point. Jesus doesn't tell us what the mark of the beast is. So guess who's not going to tell you what the mark of the beast is? This pastor. <laughs> if Jesus didn't make it clear, guess who's not going to say, well, you know, Jesus didn't make it clear, but let me straighten it up for you. Let me tell you what Jesus didn't want to tell you. Not doing that, folks. Not going there. Because if Jesus would have wanted us to know the exact details, what would he have done? Told us. Why do I say that? I'm glad you asked. Look at Revelation 1, 12 and 16. In Revelation 1, 12, we read this. It's not going to be on the screen. Just listen. Uh, we, we, we read that, that there are seven golden lampstands in Revelation. It doesn't say what they are, just seven golden lampstands. In verse 16, there's these seven stars. These seven golden lampstands, these seven stars keep showing up. But we don't know what they are. Unless we read verses 19 and 20. And here's what it says. Listen closely. Revelation 1, 19. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. Jesus is saying to John, write what you've seen, what's now and what will take place later. And then Jesus says this. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Each of the seven churches had an angel watching over it, right? The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What are the seven lampstands? They're the seven churches. What are the seven stars? What are the angels of the churches? How do we know that? Everybody watch now. Watch this. Because Jesus told us. So does Jesus have, did Jesus have the ability in the book of Revelation to explain these things to us? Did he have the ability? What's the answer? Yes. But did he explain everything to us? What's the answer? No. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Some people, when they read the book of Revelation, and some of you are going to be disappointed that I'm not going to do this, but I'm telling you, this is a, a, a humble act of a pastor saying, I'm simply not smarter than Jesus, and I'm not going to do what Jesus did, wouldn't do. Jesus could have explained every detail. I don't think he wanted us to know the answer to every detail. I think he wanted us to see the, the, the beauty and the power and the awe and at times the fear and the, just whoa and experience it, but not dissect every word and every image. Here's what I learned in like sixth or seventh grade in a science class. We dissected frogs. Did you ever dissect in school? I don't know if they do that anymore. One time in high school, we dissected piglets. Does it, did, raise your hand if you ever were in a class where they dissected. They may not do that anymore. It's probably, I mean, they were dead, just so you know. They were dead before we dissected them. But let me ask you a question. If the animals hadn't been dead and we dissected them, what would they be after we dissected them? What's the answer? Dead. When you dissect something, you kill it. All right? I want to suggest if you dissect the book of Revelation, you kill it. If every... Two words, you go, what's that mean? What's that mean? What's that? No, that's, I don't think that. And it started to be, you don't get the, you don't, it's like watching a movie with two people next to you who every single thing, they, oh, this means this, I think this is this, and they have all these theories, but they don't ever watch the movie. 
So we're not going to dissect the book of Revelation. We're going to let the power, the beauty of, of who Jesus is, of what he did, of how all things, we're just going to see it together. And say, what does that mean for ourselves and our lives? We're going to focus on Jesus. We're going to learn what he has to say to us. And then we're going to talk about living for him. And, and so we're going, to, we're going to approach the book of Revelation in a way that is meant to give us the big picture. And I'm going to give you kind of the bottom line here. A spoiler alert. I'm going to tell you the two biggest themes of the book of Revelation. So if you don't want me to give it away, plug your ears for 30 seconds. But here's your spoiler alert, okay? Uh, there's two primary themes in the book of Revelation. Here's number one. Brace yourselves. God wins, right? God wins, right? You read the book of Revelation. Here's what you find out. When it's all said and done, there is only one on the throne, and his name is God Almighty. Our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when it's all said and done, when the dust settles, God is on the throne. There's a battle, there's a victory, and there's an eternal condition of glory, and God Almighty rules and reigns. Someone say amen. amen. Okay, that's one. Here's the second thing. A big message of the book of Revelation. Hold the hand of Jesus until the dust settles. Then, in the first century and today, there's a lot of messes in the world. There's a lot of dust being churned up. There's a lot of anxiety and fear and worry and uncertainty. The first service, we had the first two, more than the first two rows filled with high school and middle school kids. And I look at these kids thinking, they don't know are we in school or out of school? Are we online or in person? Are we wearing masks or aren't we wearing masks? Can I hang out with my friends? Are we, can we play sports? It's just like question after question. It's just like, what's going on? But that's true in the medical community. That's true in the educational community. That's true in the military community. It's true. I mean, it is a time of incredible, well, I don't know what's coming next, and I don't know what's going on. And that's because nobody knows what's going on. But here's the message. Just hold the hands of Jesus until the dust settles. Because when the dust settles, go back to number one. God wins. Right? Don't be worried. Don't be anxious. Don't be consumed with all the stuff happening in this world. This last week, I made a really big mistake. Here's the mistake I made. I was clearing some apps off my phone just every so often. I don't use that anymore. I don't use that anymore. And there was one for a local news station. So I, I hit that app. I was going to delete it, but I hit that app. And six stories came up. As I read that, just as I just read the titles of the six stories, like I feel like my heart's starting to kind of pound. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Oh, and I, I open one, like, oh my God, you know, it's like, it's terrible news. It's, it's all negative, and it's all I'm thinking. And I was like, delete, get it out of here. <laughs> you know, here, can, I, can I give you a suggestion in this season? Read and listen to the amount of news you need to to know what's going on in the world, to be smart, and to pray. But spend more time reading this book than reading or watching the news. If you're watching like a 12-hour news cycle all day long, no wonder you're so anxious. If you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and hold his hand in the midst of the storm and the challenges, you know who he is. And even when the dust is kind of up and you can't see him as clearly as you'd want to, you can feel his hand holding your hand and you keep walking with him and walking with him and walking with him. The book of Revelations tells us that God wins, but in the meantime, when things look messy, hold the hand of Jesus. Don't give up on your faith. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. As we walk through this series each week in the, in the coming nine weeks, uh, we're going to have kind of this three different movements of each message, and we're going to kind of look at, first, to kind of get the picture. We're going to look at what's the vision, what's the picture that Revelation is painting. We're going to look at that vision, that picture, some aspect of the vision of Revelation every week. And then we're going to talk about, well, what does it mean? How do we learn from that vision? What's the lessons we can learn? And then we're going to talk about getting a move on it, getting into action, doing something. You know, the book of James, James says, don't be a hearer of the word only, deceiving yourself. Do what it says. So each week of the book of Revelation, we're going to try to get a vision of what's happening. You know, not, not to dissect it, but let that vision kind of sweep over us. We're going to try to learn some basic lessons from that vision. What do we learn about Jesus, about ourselves, about our world, about how to live? And then you're going to get a challenge to hold on to Jesus, to keep walking with him and living him, living in his presence no matter what you face. And so getting a picture, a vision, look with me at Revelation 1, 12 through 16. And this is, this John has, has heard the voice of Jesus, but in this, in this part of John 1, John, the apostle, turns around. And remember, he saw Jesus risen, but now he sees Jesus in glory. He saw Jesus ascend, but now he sees the heavenly Jesus. In this vision. So Revelation 1, 12 through 16. And as I read these words, here's my challenge to you. 
Don't just listen. But picture in your mind. If it helps to close your eyes, close your eyes. Because this is meant to be experienced and heard and seen. And so John turns around, and this is what he sees. Revelation 1, beginning of verse 12. John says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now you know what those are. It's the churches. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes, his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. John has this vision of Jesus, this picture of Jesus. Can you see him? Can you see Jesus in his glory? Can you see what the picture that John saw, what he's experiencing? He says, when I heard his voice, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. What is that? That's the seven churches. And among the lampstands is someone like a son of man. That's Jesus. I love this. He's walking among the churches. We can know that because we know the golden lampstands are the churches. I believe Jesus is walking among his church today. We prayed for Calvary uh, Church just down the road here. The presence of Jesus is there. We pray for Shoah and the presence of Jesus is here. Uh, Pastor Walt, who's one, a member of our, the organic outreach team, is, is preaching and, and, uh, and teaching in Kenya. The spirit of God is there, the presence of Jesus. He walks among the church. He says, I saw one like a son of man. That son of man imagery comes from the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel paints this picture of a son of man. Son of man was the term that Jesus used to refer to himself more than any other term. He called himself the son of man. Here's Jesus, and he's walking among the churches. He says he's got a robe reaching down to his feet. It's royalty, authority, power, a golden sash around his chest. You know, the hair on his head is white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes are like blazing fire, piercing, glorious, powerful. His feet are like bronze glowing in a furnace. And I love this. Have you ever stood at the edge of a waterfall? I mean, you're talking to someone, you can hardly, you can hardly hear over it because the water's rushing. Says, and, and, and his voice is like the sound of rushing waters. Like, the voice of Jesus. You know, in his right hand, he holds seven stars. He holds the angels that watch over the churches, and he walks among the churches. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp, double edged sword authority, victory, truth. And his face is shining like the sun in all its brilliance. That's our Jesus. That's the one we keep our eyes fixed on. When the world's going crazy, <clears throat> when we're not sure what's coming next, keep a vision of Jesus in your heart and your mind. And if you see him, if you celebrate who he is, then you kind of live in the presence and the glory of Jesus. We should live, we should walk, we should be in the, in the presence of the glory of Jesus. We're given this vision. And in John chapter 1, I, I mean, sorry, in Revelation, John writes in chapter 1 about a vision of Jesus, chapter 4, chapter 5, the last two chapters, another vision of Jesus. And all the way through Revelation, Jesus comes riding on a white horse. All these pictures of Jesus, pictures of Jesus. Get that picture in your mind. Because here's what the world does constantly. The word consciousness says, look over here, look over here, focus on this, be anxious about this, worry about this. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. Oh, oh. You're like, you know, you're just. And God says, no, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Hebrews says this, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. If ever the church needed to keep their eyes on Jesus, it's now. There are so many distractions, so many things that create anxiety and worry. But when you keep your eyes on Jesus, it doesn't take away the anxious things. 
But when you see him, everything changes. When you live and dwell in the presence of Jesus. So the second thing we're thinking about is getting the message and understanding God's truth. So we have this vision of Jesus, but we've got to not just see Jesus, we have to understand the truth of Jesus. So look at Revelation 1, 4 through 6. And in Revelation 1, 4 through 6, uh, we, we get this, this message of truth. So we read this in, Gen- uh, in Revelation 1, 4. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. These are seven actual churches. I'll show you a graph of this in the coming weeks where they're, they actually they, they go in the exact order going in a circle because at the beginning of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, there's notes, little notations to each of the churches because this the revelation would be taken and read at each of these churches. So it's kind of, they're kind of in a circle like this. And so we'll talk, these are real churches in a real place, just like Shoreline Church is a real church in a real place. And real people heard these words and God spoke to them just like God wants to speak to you today. So John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, listen to this, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the ruler of all kings. He is the king of all kings. And I love this. To him who loves us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and you'll understand to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. That's our Jesus. And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. What has Jesus done? Who is this Jesus? And what has he done? Just look at this passage, and, and just there's so much here. But again, when you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you understand who he is. So he is the faithful witness. He is the faithful witness who speaks the truth to us and only the truth to us. I love this. He is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now, some of you that know the Bible, you go, wait a minute. Jesus isn't the first one to raise from the dead. He raised Lazarus before this, John chapter 11. Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament and the power of the Spirit saw people raised from the dead. Why does it say he's the firstborn from the dead? This is why. Because everyone else who rose died again later. Not Jesus. He rose, he conquered sin, hell, death, and the grave, and he rose for eternity. He ascended, and now we see him in his glory. He's preparing a place for you and a place for me. He is the firstborn from the dead in that he conquered sin, death, and and the grave. He is the ruler over all kings. Jesus rules and reigns over every king and every kingdom. He is the lover of your soul. To him who loves us. That's our Jesus. He shed his blood for your sins. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. He paid the price. He washes our sins away. He gives us new life. I love this. He made you and me royal priests. When you put your faith in Jesus, whether you're in junior high or high school or 40 or 80 or 95, if you're a follower of Jesus, God says you are a royal priesthood. It says it in 1 Peter and other places, but right here, he's made us royal priests. What does that mean? You have complete access to God Almighty anytime. You don't have to come through a peace, priest. You don't have to come through a pastor. Please, 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 don't look at me and say, oh, you know, I can, you know, Kevin's got some special, you know, some special connection with God. You are, if you are a Christian, if you come to the cross and confess your sins and receive Jesus, you are a royal priesthood. I have a role of preaching and teaching, but I I am no closer to God than anyone else here. I've I've said that people, people say, no, that's not true, you are. And I'm like, you're wrong. (laughs) I am not fully who God wants me to be yet. I'm still on a journey of growing to be more like Jesus, and so are you, but we are God's royal priesthood, and you have access to God Almighty through Jesus Christ. That's who he is, and who he is shows you who you are. And he invites you to praise him and to give him glory. He invites you into his presence to praise him, to glorify him. So so we get a vision of Jesus. We're kind of getting this vision, this picture of Jesus. And then we get the truth and let the truth get a hold of us and understand the truth that it says. But here's the third thing. Getting a move on it. Taking action in our life and the church. 
You see, if you have a vision of Jesus and you understand the truth of Jesus, but you do nothing about it, you're not living fully the way God wants you to. Does God want you to see Jesus? Absolutely. Does God want you to understand the truth of the, of the word of God and of the gospel? Yes. Is that enough? No. He wants you to walk with Jesus, live for Jesus, become more like him, to be transformed. And I love what happens in Revelation 1, 17 to 18. This is right after, right after John has this vision. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and, and that son of man. And he sees this vision, uh, you know, the eyes, the, 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 the voice, and all this. It visualizes his face, you know, brilliant like the sun. And then we see, how, does, how do you respond when you have a vision of Jesus? How do you respond when you really see Jesus in his heavenly glory? Look what we read in Revelation 1.17. When I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as though dead. Bam! He just falls flat on his face. When he sees the glory of Jesus, the only posture he could find is flat on his face in front of Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And I love what happens next. It says, then he placed his right hand on me, the tenderness of Jesus. Then he placed his right hand on me. He said, do not be afraid. I love that. His opening words, Jesus says, do not be afraid. He sees Jesus in all of his glory. And Jesus Christ, the resurrected, glorified, heavenly King of Kings, touches John. And he says, do not be afraid. And then he reminds him of who he is. I am the first and the last. Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus says, I hold the keys of death and hell. Don't you love that picture? John has a vision of Jesus. He falls at the feet of Jesus as if he's dead. And Jesus touches him. He places his right hand on me. He says, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And John, by the way, I hold the keys of death and hell. Do you need to hear that message? Death is the final enemy. Death is some people's greatest fear. But when you know that Jesus holds the keys of death and hell, when you know that he rules and reigns, and if you've come to faith in him, you belong to him, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I've never had more bullets fly at me than the last two years from every direction you can imagine. We've made decisions as a church and I'm talking praying with our, our board, with our leadership team, praying with our pastors, being discerning, looking at the scriptures, doing the best we can. We make a decision, bam, 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 from like five different directions. And people are, are angry about the same thing that happened for totally different reasons. And may not even understand what's going on, but it's just boom, nastiness. You felt it. You've experienced it. It's been a crazy couple of years. But if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and if we see him, if we fall before him, he places his hand on you and me. And he says, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and now I'm alive forever and ever. And Jesus says, I hold the keys of death and Hades. I'm in charge around here. I've relied on that a lot of times this last two years. I just had to turn my eyes to Jesus and say, Jesus, we're doing the best we can. We're trying the hardest we can. And I hear Jesus say, don't be afraid. It's okay. I'm in charge. Do you need to hear that? Fix your eyes on him. Bow down before him and walk with him. And so I want to give you some invitations and ask you if you would make these declarations for yourself and for yourself as part of the church of Jesus, whether you're at home or around the campus or here in the worship center, would you listen to these words and say, you know, I, I need to... I need to live this way out of seeing Jesus, out of a vision, out of learning who he is. And when I know who Jesus is, then I know who I am. Do you recognize that? When you know who Jesus is, you know who you are. You know what makes me really sick? It doesn't make, not, not like so much throw up sick, but, like, but kind of like bar from my mouth a little bit sick. You know what I'm talking about? Like a little bit like, ah. Is anytime I hear somebody say, I've got to go discover who I am. I've got to figure out who I am. I'm like, just go to Jesus. And when you know who he is, you know who you are. You're a royal priest. Peter says, you're a holy nation, a people who belong to God. 
You are a son or a daughter of the living God of heaven. And heaven is your home. And your place has already been won and purchased through Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, don't go off weird places looking for yourself. Because you won't find yourself there, but you'll find a lot of trouble. Where, where's there? Whatever it is. I've got to go discover myself. Turn to Jesus and see who he is. And when he tells you who you are, hold on to that. At 15, when I became a Christian, I recognized I was a child of God and called to share his love with others. That's all I needed. I just needed to know I was loved and belonged to somebody. And it so happens, I belong to the Lord of glory. And if you're a Christian, so do you. And if you're not yet a Christian, you could be. You just receive this risen, glorified Jesus. Confess your sins and follow him. And here at Shoreline, we talk about that a lot. But if you're already a Christian, don't go trying to find yourself. If you're not sure who you are, come talk with the pastor. We'll tell you who you are. And it's good news. But I'm not perfect yet. Correct. <laughs> I'm your pastor. Am I perfect yet? What's the answer? Thank you. I didn't want to, no! It would have been like a little, but, yeah, no, but no. Are you perfect yet? No, we're, we're, we're growing, in, we're being sanctified in Christ. We're, we're cleansed of sin. And before God, we're perfect in terms of we'll never be judged for our sin. Jesus paid the price. But as we walk through this life, we're learning to become more like Jesus. Do I love my wife perfectly all the time? No, I'm trying. Do I do a perfect job as a pastor all the time? No, but I'm striving to be more who God wants me to be. I'm trying to be a better neighbor, I'm trying to sh shine the light of Jesus in more ways but it's a journey, and you're on that journey too. But on that journey, we make decisions. So here, here's some I wills, and then we'll do some we wills. Just, just think about these things and say, is this the desire of your heart as you see Jesus, as you fall down, as you hear him speak to you and call you his own, and you know you're the truth? Here's the first I will. I will fall at his feet in humble and passionate worship. I will fall down and worship Jesus. When we gather together like this, whether you're at home, whether you're here in the worship center, Give your whole heart to God. Worship him with passion. We see this in the book of Revelation. This heavenly worship, it's glorious. Choose now to begin worshiping with passion. I will, here's another one. I will walk and live a fearless life. I will walk and live, I'm not gonna live in fear. I'm not gonna let the enemy get me all wound up all the time and anxious and fear. I'm gonna say, I know who I am. I know who Jesus is. I read the end of the book. I know how the, I know how the story ends. And as the dust is settling, I'm going to hold the hands of Jesus, but I will not be ruled by fear and anxiety. I will come to Jesus again and again and again. And if you need prayer after the service, come for prayer. And if, and if you've got some things you've got to work through, you need, need a Christian counselor. We have lay counselors here. We can refer to great Christian counselors. If you, you, know, if you need to get some sin out of your life, make some smarter choices, yeah, do that. But don't let fear rule your life. Say, I will not let fear dominate and rule my life. I will. I will fix my eyes on Jesus who is glorious and present and powerful. Just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and all the things that scream for your attention. And there's lots of them. Don't let those things rule. You say, well, what screams for my attention is my kids. Okay, pay, take care of them. <laughs> but, but even as you're doing that, say, Jesus, my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you. My heart's on you. And when your eyes are on Jesus, when you see him in his glory, everything changes, even in crazy times like this. And then, to say, we will. We will join in worship, now and forever. To say, we as a body are going to worship Jesus. And I want to say a word to all of our folks. We, and we've got hundreds and hundreds, if not, you know, we've got lots and lots of people online still. We're so glad you're with us. But hey, put some clothes on. Stop doing the laundry. When we gather, like, I'm going to challenge you at home. If you're still at home because you're concerned about health things, if you're still at home because it's just more convenient, I'm going to challenge you when you're ready, come back. If you're not in the area or you can't be here, when you're online worshiping, give it your whole heart, all you have. Don't multitask Jesus. And in the worship center, don't multitask Jesus in here either. <laughs> right? You can, uh, okay, let me respond to four. Hey, I got 18 emails done during church. Problem. All right, I will, we will worship with passion. We will be bold and fearless as a church, as God's people. We will stand for Jesus. We will live for Jesus as a church. When the world says, oh, you can't believe that anymore, we go, well, we got one book. And can I tell you something? As a church, we got, it's, that one book is made up of 66 books, 
Old and New Testament, 66 different books, written, inspired by the Spirit by different people at different times, but God's truth from beginning to end. If I didn't believe this book is true, I would not be a pastor. If I didn't believe I could hold this book from beginning to end as the Spirit breathed the Word of God, I'd be doing something else. Hold to his word, hold to his truth, and be bold and fearless. We will live with hope now and forever. If there's anyone in the world who should be living with hope in challenging times, it's Christians. Why? We know the end of the story. We know Jesus. So live with hope. Man, but man, you don't know. What I'm facing seems so hopeless. The situation might seem hopeless. The situation in some moments might be hopeless. Some situations. But not all of life. Because God's on the throne. Jesus rules and reigns. And the spirit of God lives in you. So if you feel discouraging, if you don't have hope, really dig in over these nine weeks to the book of Revelation. It will, it will give you a fresh new hope. And one last, we will. We will tell the world that Jesus rules, Jesus reigns, and Jesus is here right now. He rules, he reigns, and he's here right now. And we can share that with people. Pray for opportunities. Only 3% of Christians, most studies show only 3% of Christians have the calling of an evangelist. That means 97% of Christians don't, don't have the spiritual gift and calling of an evangelist. But every 97% of Christians, 100% of Christians are called to shed the light and the love of Jesus. You can do that. So as you get a vision of Jesus, as you fall down and worship him, as he places his hand on you, he says, listen, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm watching over you. As you stand up to walk and live for him, shine his light. Tell his story. If ever there was a time when people are longing for something more, it's now. And I would love it if, and I've never said this in 12 years being the pastor here, I've never actually told you to send a link to a sermon to non-Christian friends. But if you have friends that are not Christian, you think, man, this word of, there's a word of hope and encouragement that, that the, going through Revelations isn't going to be some kind of weird you know, freak show. It's going to be like we're going to let God speak, see the picture, and follow Jesus. If you think that would speak to a non-believing friend, get the link from this sermon on our website and just send it off to a friend and say, hey, this is what our pastor preached on this morning. I thought you might be encouraged by this in this crazy world. And then when they watch the sermon, right now they're going to go, I know why you sent it. She sent it because the pastor said he should, but it's not a regular thing. I've never done this before. But I, 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 we can witness to people in lots of ways, sharing a song with them, sharing our story with them, sharing a link to a sermon, inviting them to come to a church thing. But, but in this season, when people are, I can't imagine walking through our world the way it is right now without Jesus. I can't imagine it. And, and we need to share that Jesus with those who are walking alone in this crazy time. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer over these coming nine weeks. I'm so excited um, that we can open your word and let your spirit speak to us. I pray that we pray together, Jesus, that you would give us a vision of who you are and what you've done. We would hold to that vision and we would know the truth of your word and then we would get a move on it. We would live the way you've called us to live. We thank you that in the first century, the churches, in these seven churches, they, they heard this message and Lord, they didn't give up or quit. They kept sharing the gospel and it's come all the way down to our generation today. Now, Lord, we are the generation that gets to hold to you, love you, seek you, and share your good news with others. May we be faithful, and may this journey through Revelation stir our hearts, fix our eyes on you, transform our thinking and our lives, and let us go as your people to this world. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? And I'm going to send you off with a word of blessing, but I'm going to give you a couple invitations before I send you off. So let's stand together. If you're able to outdoors, if you're able to stand, please feel free to stand at home. Just stand to kind of receive a blessing. But here's my invitation. Number one, if you're going to be moving out of the area or going to be kind of moving on from Shoreline Church in the next couple of months, I want to invite you to come right now if you're on campus right through the lobby and to the youth room, to the, to the garden room, and we want, to, we, we want to send you off with a blessing. We want to give you a book, and we also want to give you a coin, this coin that, that reminds you to pray for Shoreline and also that you're going on mission, that you'll be as witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so we, want to, we don't want you just to disappear. So if you're going to be moving on before the end of November, we'll be doing ascending time at the end of November. But if you're moving on before then, please do us the honor. Give us about five minutes. Come by there. And we have pastors there. I'll be there. We want to give you a gift. We want to give you the coin. We want to pray for you. And really to say, God, whatever reason this person is making the move, 
really, God, you're sending them. So go ahead of them and bless them and protect them and use them. We want to bless you and send you off. So join us for that. If you want prayer for anything, if you're online, all you need to do is send a, a prayer to the email address and we'll put it on our prayer list and give it to all of our prayer people at the church. It's a great group of powerful prayers. And if you want to, you can call the phone number there and we'll have people waiting to pray with you. If you're in the worship center, in the family worship venue or on the, in the courtyard, we're going to have people right in the front here to pray with you. So come right forward for prayer and they will be honored to pray for you. And if you're new at Shoreline, if you're on, online, we are glad you're with us. We welcome you personally. Just text the word welcome to the phone number you see there and we will then respond to you, reach out to you and get to know you better. And if you're on campus... Right through the lobby here is the Connection Center. If you go there, they got a little gift bag they want to give you, and they want to give you a warm personal welcome, and just thank you for coming, and, and answer any questions you have about the church. Uh, thank you for being part of worship today, whether you're away online or whether you're on campus. We are the church of Jesus. So just open your hearts and receive this blessing as we close our time together. As we close this time, may you walk and live in the presence of of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the risen Savior and Lord. May you see his face with his eyes blazing like fire, his voice thundering like water, and his face shining like the sun in all its brilliance. And as you see him, may you fall down and worship him and hear him speak to you, feel him touch you and say, don't be afraid. Remember who I am. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and now I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell. May you walk in the ruler of the heavens and the earth and may you shine his light and his love as you live for him. Go in his peace, go in his presence and we'll see you back here next Sunday. God bless you.